All right. Hopefully, we're going to go ahead and get started now. I um, want to respect everybody's time and, and get going well. Uh, again, I would encourage everyone to mute your mic. Um, that way that we're not getting a lot of background noise and we don't have side conversations going on. Um, so go ahead and try to mute your mic right now. It's the bottom left-hand corner. Uh, if you have a question um, while uh, things are going on, I'm going to be kind of watching the Zoom group chat. Um, so you can push your questions up there uh, and we'll pick some of those questions out and ask those along the way as well. Um, so uh, feel free, feel free to, to do that. Um, and then I may just have you ask it if the group stays small enough. We had like 85 people register. Um, and this group that we have right now is pretty manageable. So um, if, we, if the group stays about this size, I may just call you out and ask you to go ahead and ask your question and comment on, on what it is that you wanted to say. Um, we are glad that you've joined us. Uh, so um, we want to we want to build a conversation here. That's what Steve and I have wanted uh, from the very beginning. Uh, so we're going to try to do that here if this group stays about this size. Uh, but if it gets larger, uh, we'll, we'll adjust and see what we need to do. One of the things that, that you will be able to do is between times, um, you can uh, head over to Facebook and um, go to the Discipleship Cohort. Uh, it sh you should be able to search for Online Discipleship Cohort and then CWC uh, in parentheses. Uh, and you should be able to find that. You'll have to request to join. Um, but if your name is on the list for the cohort, um, I'll go ahead and include you. You can ask questions there. You can have discussion with each other there. Uh, that's a good way to even help each other out uh, in that forum. And I'll be engaging in that as well, just kind of following up on some of the things we're talking about over the coming weeks. Um, right now, we've got planned for about four meetings. Um, and those, I think, uh, were in the registration. I guess I didn't look at it that closely. That's my fault. Uh, but we've got four um, scheduled right now. Uh, and I, I can probably send those out to you if you don't know what those are already after we're done here. Um, one of the things I want to do is uh, just kind of um, pray for us before we get started. Uh, and then I'm going to ask Steve a question to kind of get us started. My name is Eric Crisp. I'm the discipleship pastor at College Wesleyan Church, if you didn't know that already. Uh, pastor Steve, uh, Dr. Steve Deneff is our senior pastor here at College Wesleyan. Uh, and we're looking forward to this time together. So we're glad that you're here. Um, Let's pray together uh, to, get, to get going. Let's listen for the Spirit uh, for just a minute. <clears throat> Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, uh, we are so thankful uh, that we have the opportunity to gather together and to, um, uh, and to engage in a conversation uh, about making disciples. Uh, Father, we know that if we're here, uh, we believe that, that uh, making more and better disciples is crucial uh, to your mission in the world. Um, so, God, I pray that we would um, seek your spirit, uh, that we would hear from you, uh, that we would help each other grow uh, and develop uh, into who you have called us and created us to be. Uh, so bless this time, and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Um, well, we're going to let Steve um, talk for a few minutes first. Uh, and what I kind of want him to, to talk a little bit about is just kind of the importance um, of defining the target in discipleship. A lot of times we participate in discipleship and we just do things that, that we've always done. Um, but I want Steve to talk just for a few minutes about defining the target uh, for discipleship. So Steve? Yep. Thanks, Eric. Um, when I started in ministry uh, 35, 36 years ago, the first thing I did was, uh, was to try to win as many people to Christ as I could. I'd win five, six, seven people a week to Christ but I noticed that they weren't staying in the church. They weren't even attaching to the church. Uh, um, they, weren't, they weren't in their Bibles alone. They weren't connecting with other Christians. I just didn't see the signs of life. Uh, so even though they had, they had followed all the steps, um, they, they weren't growing. And so um, I, I, I knew almost immediately that we had to develop something to disciple these people and bring them along because most of them, not all of them, but most of them were very, uh, very intentional and very serious about the commitment that they made to Christ initially. They just didn't know what to do next. They would have done it if I would have had a plan, but I didn't have a plan. So the first mistake I made was to just uh, a, a start trying to outline a program 
that would take people from their first few days in Christ to become mature Christians. Um, it, that was a mistake because I didn't start at the end. What I've learned since uh, that is most important is um, in order to know where I'm going to take somebody spiritually, I have to have a target in mind. I can't, I probably, I can't stress that enough because I think so often the first thing that we do is we throw ourselves right into a program. So right now, what some of the leaders in the Wesleyan Church are calling for from local churches is a program or what is your plan of discipleship? And that's a really good question. They have the right to call that, and we should give that to them. Uh, but before we know what that plan is, we have to know where we're trying to take them. What do we want them to be when we're done? Once we have clearly defined that, then we can back up and start um, outlining what are the milestones from their first few days in Christ to that, to that final point. So often we'll just say, well, my, my goal is to make them a fully devoted follower of Christ. But that doesn't really tell me anything. What do we mean by a fully devoted follower of Christ? So we started to list a bunch of things um, uh, that we thought that might be. Um, you know, we said a, person's a, a person is a mature disciple um, when they have memorized scripture or when they have another person in their life that they're discipling. But we were still coming up with these things kind of willy-nilly. So what we then did um, next was to go to the scriptures. It's like if all else fails, consult the scriptures, right? So I, I, I filled a room full of um, leaders in the church, and I wrote some of the key scriptures from the Apostle Paul's prayers uh, on the board. So, for instance, Colossians chapter 1, Ephesians chapter 1, Ephesians chapter 3, Philippians chapter 1. Just listed these prayers, and then I handed them out into the room, and I said, what I'd like you guys to do for a moment is just read through the things that Paul is praying for. So, for instance, in Ephesians chapter 1, uh, he says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened with all wisdom and revelation. So what they would do is they'd write on their piece of paper, he's praying for the eyes of our heart to be open. Each person or team in the room had probably five or six things on their list that they believe Paul had said uh, we should pray for. And then I went around the room and I said, now I'm going to go and read me your list. And so I started compiling the lists on the whiteboard in front of them. And what the first thing that struck us is that the stuff that we've been praying for, Paul never prays for. Whenever I called a meeting, people were praying for the sick or they were praying for money Paul didn't pray for any of that. He prays for sanctification. He prays for enlightenment. He prays for spiritual power. He prays that they would know the will of God in Philippians chapter 1. Um, so that was this kind of moment of reckoning where we went, wait a minute. Uh, we don't even have a value system for discipleship. We talk about it, but we don't, we don't even pray for this kind of stuff. So we have to start changing the way that we pray. So we started to pray differently as leaders in the church. Then we looked at our lists. And there, as I said, there was four or five short lists. Each list had five or six things in it. And I said, can we find common denominators? Because it seems like there's some things that Paul prayed for in Philippians 1 that he also prayed for in Ephesians 3 that he also prayed for in Colossians chapter 1, we started overlapping those, those uh, five or six lists. And, and what we did was distill that list of Paul's prayers into just a handful of things that he said were spiritual maturity. And none of the things on our first list they memorized scripture, you know, they, they were trying to disciple someone else, was really, was actually in that list of things that Paul said he was praying for. Now, it doesn't mean they couldn't be on our list. It just meant 
that that wasn't on Paul's list. So, so as, as far as defining a spiritually mature person, then we started to have a target that was more informed by scripture and less informed by the, by my own impulses or my own convictions. So now the list with such things, you know, is that, um, I'm trying to create someone who knows and does the will of God. They, they actively listen to what God's voice is saying to them, and they look for ways to obey him. He says in Ephesians 5, find out what pleases the Lord. <laughs> so that's one of the things on the list. I'm looking for somebody that has spiritual power, whose faith moves things. When they pray, something happens as a result of that. Their words don't fall to the ground. Things of that sort. But, but, but the principle here was, um, was trying, to, trying to pull the leaders in the church together and help me define what we believe a fully devoted follower of Christ is. And let the scriptures be one of the main voices that, that speaks into that. I'll stop talking for now, Eric. <laughs> Yeah, did anybody, like, does anybody have any um, pushback or question regarding uh, what Steve just talked about there? Steve, you talked about um, gathering a group of people together to kind of go through this process with. Can you talk about um, who was on that team, like not specifically, but uh, how you chose those people, how those people ended up in the room? Yeah. Uh, first, I went to the church board. Um, uh, not everybody on the church board knew that when they got elected, they were signing up for stuff like this. They thought they were signing up to be a board of administration. I didn't need administrators. I needed elders. You know, I needed spiritual guides. So I went to the church board first and just, just said, um, uh, I'm looking for a couple of you to to join with me on this. Then I went to uh, a couple of people in the congregation that were uh, that I thought had vibrant walks with Jesus Christ. I said clearly, there is something alive in you. You love the Scripture. You love other people. Can I get you to sit on this team with with me? I think it was maybe six or eight uh, people in that um, initial group. Can I, uh, can I segue, Eric, to the next, yeah. uh, to the next um, step? Then um, uh, that, that list lasted for a long time. Uh, and then what happened is um, we moved, I moved to college church 16 years ago. And then one of the best things we did uh, since I moved here was we gathered a bunch of our lay people into a room. This time, I bet it was maybe 40 of them. Uh, it was, again, people whose spiritual lives we knew were vibrant. Um, they were walking with Christ. They were in love with the world and with God. And we put them into a room, put them into round tables, maybe about five or six at a table. And we said, we'd like you to go back to a time in your life when uh, you were, uh, maybe you weren't a Christian and then, then you found Christ and that was a big turning point for you. Or maybe you grew up in the church and, and you just, so you just kind of grew up born again. You didn't know it, but you were, um, but there was a, there was a moment in your life with Christ where everything turned for you. Your, your spiritual life suddenly elevated, um, and can you find that time in your life when that happened and then turn to the table that you're sitting at and tell them your story? So for about 20 minutes, people just turned and had a dialogue in round tables about really important spiritual turning points in their lives. After they did that, we then said, we'd kind of like to collect the greatest hits here. You know, we'd like to hear some of the best stories in the room. Talk to us. So we started having people speak up and tell the entire uh, class 
uh, their story. Um, they didn't know this, but what we were looking for was common denominators. We think every time God transforms a person, he makes an original, <laughs> not a duplicate. But there are patterns to the movement or the work of God. And so we were looking for those patterns. What are the things that trigger those growth spurts? What kinds of changes are taking place? Do they fall into categories? Um, what, uh, um, who were the people that were around them that were significant in their lives when that, that spiritual um, awakening occurred? We're, we're trying to collect data from them. Um, and, and then from that, uh, we started to uh, discern what, what we came to call the soul shifts. Two, two things came, came out of that, that second uh, kind of collection that we did. Uh, one of the things that we got out of that is um, we got a list of some of the significant changes and those we called soul shifts. They talked about a shift from me to we or a shift from consumer to steward. And we listed those seven things. Those then became kind of the target for us. So now when you at college church, if you say, what kind of person are you trying to create? We would say it's the seven fundamental shifts that occur in a believer's heart deep below the surface, but they work themselves out sometime in their practical life. The second thing that we learned about that is that most of the times when people grow, uh, they, grow in, uh, um, um, they grow in seasons when they don't like it. Um, most of the time we grow, we're actually against it. We want to grow, but we're just opposed to the conditions that cause growth which is discomfort and, and stress and loss and frustration, all of those things. Um, and, and that was an important um, uh, learning curve for us too, because I was trained as a pastor to counsel people out of situations like that. If you were under stress or there was conflict in your marriage, my job was to step in and try to get you through that time. Um, and what I learned from those discussions is now my job is to help you stay in that time, keep you in it, because the crisis will pass all on its own eventually, someday. The question is, what will it have done to you or in you while you were in it? That was the question. Uh, so it started to change the way that we did spiritual formation, uh, especially around those uh, critical times. And we, we've come to call those um, fault lines. Steve, can you talk a little bit about what that means to, to keep someone in it during those fault line times? Yeah, it... Um, it, I'm spending more intensity, uh, 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 I'm, uh, I should say it's, it's more time intense. Um, I, instead of spending, you know, um, uh, instead of seeing like five or six people in a week, I'll see one person for five or six weeks. You just, you, you tend to focus on that person's life. Uh, it means that I don't offer solutions. I don't, I don't give a lot of advice. Um, I, I just listen really well. And then I try to connect it, if I can, to one of the soul shifts. So if someone uh, is in the middle of a marriage crisis, and they, as they explain what's happening, instead of giving them advice on how to resolve conflict, I start talking to the person themselves about, you know, Marriage is a really good time to think about me to you. <laughs> Most of the time when we marry, we try to get the other person interested in our lives. That's why we married them. You know, I love you basically means I love me and I love the way I feel whenever you're with me. But marriage is an opportunity to actually learn how to live an outward focused life with one other person in this world. So maybe part of the conflict is the work that God is doing in you. So in that case, see, I'm not trying to solve the marriage crisis. I'm using the marriage crisis to leverage spiritual growth 
in the believer's heart. What kind of questions do you have? What's popping out? It's quiet. It is quiet. <laughs> well, Steve, why don't you, what, you want to talk about starting well, um, what happens at the new birth, um, uh, and then maybe we can, we can turn a corner and uh, I can ask them some questions. Sure. Um, one, of the, one of the best pieces of advice I heard uh, was, is by Gordon Smith, who teaches spiritual formation or did out on the West Coast. Um, uh, I think he's Christian Missionary Alliance. And what Smith said was, um, he said, in any discipleship process, there's three things that we have to pay attention to. The first one is we have to define the target. If we don't know what specifically we're trying to produce, then any discipleship program will take us there because <laughs> we don't know where we're going. Um, the second thing he said is we have to define the launch. What happens in the hour I first believed? Uh, and then the third thing we have to do is actually define the trajectory from the launch to the target. So one more time, if we start with the end in mind, and then we go back and talk about the launch, what happens at the beginning of a person's uh, spiritual journey? What, what is really happening there? The actual process itself, the discipleship formula that we use in our church can be contextualized, and it will be organic with the people that create it. It will, be, it, it will fit our church. But I think so often when programs fail, it's because we don't know exactly what we're trying to produce and we don't really know the raw material that we're working with. And so the formula becomes clumsy and it just becomes too much structure. Um, that meant that we had to pay attention to those, uh, to those first few critical hours when a person comes to Christ. Uh, and in, in, in our church, it, it helps us to keep that in the language of life. I think one of the concerns I have for salvation as we talk about it today is that we speak of it as if it were a transaction. In exchange for repentance, I am given the forgiveness of sins. Well, there's everything in the world wrong with that. It reduces the gospel to the simple forgiveness of sins, which is far too small of a gospel. And it explains why when people feel their sins are forgiven, they sit in the church and never move again, because they've got the gospel. And it also presumes that the purpose of repentance is to get something back in exchange, like the forgiveness of sins. So it, it becomes purely transactional, and it doesn't, it doesn't uh, give us a catalyst for moving that spiritual life. There's no engine in that person at all. So it helps us to put um, conversion in the language of life rather than in the language of forgiveness. Uh, and say, when a person is in Christ, the life of God has been transmitted into that person's heart. There is new life inside of them. Uh, and, and, and the purpose of spiritual formation then is to come around that life and to create the environment where that life can grow. So we talk about what are the signs of life. Um, I, I don't think we can assume that everyone who prays a prayer and asks Jesus into their heart is necessarily a Christian. What Paul said um, in Romans chapter eight is, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Paul does not say, if anyone doesn't pray this prayer, he says, the sign of life is that we have the spirit of Christ inside of us. That's organic. So now we're looking for signs or symptoms that the Holy Spirit has, in fact, 
transmitted his life into that new believer. What are the signs of life? So we go then to back to the scripture. We go to John chapter 17. We go to Galatians chapter 5 and 6. Go to Ephesians chapter 4, Philippians chapter 2, we, and uh, 1 John chapter 2 and 3. And we put the scripture to work again. And by reading these scripture passages say, what does the Bible say happens when the Holy Spirit enters a person's life? That's what we're looking for. And until we know that a person has genuinely been infused with the life of God, we don't begin the discipleship process. It's more of a pre-discipleship process, which is continuing to immerse them in healthy groups, putting them inside the body, giving them access to the people, to the messages, uh, and to the, um, uh, to the means of grace. But we're still waiting for that life to be formed by the, by the Spirit. Um, so I think it's, a, I, uh, sorry to like beat that horse so long, but it's, uh, I, um, I really want to see, uh, I mean, our, our, our church steer away from, um, from this transactional thing. Because I, I just think it has created uh, too many stillborn um, children. Chris, go ahead. Uh, Steve, thank you for that. Um, I, I live north of Traverse City, Michigan in a uh, very entrenched, what was a Dutch reformed community. Uh -huh. um, it is, it's a bedroom community now, but we have, um, one of the things my heart aches over is we have a lot of that transactional belief system. So the, uh, our church is working very diligently, have been for the last couple of years on discipleship. How do you, um, especially people who have been trenched, entrenched in that transactional mindset, how do you help them, um, how do you help them recognize the signs of life that they have and move with that? Because, you know, for so many of our folks who have come from, non Wesleyan backgrounds. Um, uh, you know, the whole idea that, you know, they know Jesus and love Jesus, that's good enough, you know, and I don't really need to go to a small group. I don't need to be in a class. I come to worship. That's enough for me. Mm -hmm. see, that, that's how I see that transactional aspect coming true in my own context. And I've been here 21 years, um, a, a privileged pastor, this church, um, uh, in the small community, but it is the thing that I kind of beat my head against the wall. Mm -hmm. um, and we are trying to move that forward. Uh, uh, how do you have any suggestions of how you help develop this whole idea that it is related to life, not just forgiveness of sin? Yeah, there's a couple of things. I, if you come from a reformed area, um, they, they move along uh, the lines of a profession of faith. I have, uh, I have good friends that pastor Christian Reformed churches, uh, one in Michigan and then one out in, uh, out in the West, West Coast. And the way that people are, are, they come to faith often in the Reformed church is uh, they are baptized as infants and then they follow the catechetical process. And then after they're confirmed, there's this moment where they make a public profession of faith and that's equivalent to conversion. So I, I agree. That's kind of the stalwart tradition that you're up, up against. There's a couple of things that I think um, uh, that might affect that, Chris. One is here in our pulpit, I preach on those signs of life um, uh, consistently and, and just flat say, if a person has the spirit of God in them, then he has a natural love of God for God's own sake, not for himself, not for what God can do for you. I'm attracted to God because God is just flat attractive. And the way that I express that is in public worship. I don't just show up. My heart and my soul is in. It's, it's those kinds. Of, so I preach on that consistently. But I think that I think the best, the best way to do that, Chris, would be to find two or three people, not more than that, 
and pull them aside and ask if if people that you think are sensitive and the soil in their life is fertile. And if, if you could pull them aside and meet with them either every week or every other week and say, can, can we just get together for breakfast and read through some portions of scripture and digest this together, me and you, to see what we think the Spirit of God is saying to us. Then I think what, you're, what that does is it creates a, 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 a small group of living cells within a body that is full of structure. But the life is not in the structure. The life is in the members who are alive. So I would pull a few off to the side and start developing a critical mass. You'll still have to pastor the church. I had to do that too. Call on everybody else who just came Sunday morning and and they weren't really going to go anywhere. But I was meeting on the side breakfast on Tuesday, Thursday nights with a guy to go make calls, you know, and in the car, you're driving from house to house and I'm getting a chance to open my life to him and him to me. And it was in those one-on-one relationships, actually, that healthy cells were formed. I'm going to jump in on that, Steve. There's some conversation going on in the chat room about kind of like uh, motivation, Right. And I think you're, you're touching on it there. I think some of some of that goes back to we have to start, um, like you said, with some smaller groups of people, um, model and participate in discipleship with them, with with the intention of being that we're all going to we're all going to also separate and and invest in discipling other people. Right. I think that's where the where our process uh, can get stagnant sometimes is that we're constantly receiving discipleship, but never do we turn and begin to make more disciples, right? Like, yeah. and yeah. like we've had conversation here about a lot lately, disciples reproduce, um, yeah. disciples make more disciples. Um, so if I'm going to be a disciple, uh, that means I'm also going to disciple others. Um, yeah, there's this idea that discipleship is a program or it's a process. So what I have to do in that model is to say, as a pastor, I have to design a program that will disciple my people to be mature followers. This is a North American uh, concept, and and, and it's it's not producing what we want it to produce. Discipleship is, is, is not a program. Discipleship is a relationship that we have with another person with a target in mind. So at the end of the day, programs can't disciple anyone. Only people can disciple. But somehow we offload that process onto programs and say, well, here, if someone comes to Christ, we'll put them in a new believers class. And then after they're in a new believers class, we'll just seamlessly move them into a membership class. And then after the... But you see, what we're doing is we're moving people through a series of classes, believing first that discipleship can be conveyed on the currency of information. We sound as though cognitive development in 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 Christian information is going to is going to nurture life, but it doesn't. The Holy Spirit nurtures life through people. And second, we're assuming that the structure itself can produce life. It can. The structure sustains life, but it doesn't produce it. So, Steve, I've, yeah, shoot. I've got a question for you. So, listening to you, I mean, I can see where there are sometimes tie ins, but I'm wondering um, how this would fit in with maybe even Wesley's model of society, class, and band meetings. Um, and how that would maybe not necessarily create a program, but create a, almost what you would call a pipeline. Yeah, 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 that's great. We, one of the things we did um, uh, uh, was I put, I, I hand-selected 11 leaders in the church. Some were on the board, some were not. And um, 
the dumb thing I did was, uh, was after reading Wesley's model, um, they said, what is this group? And I said, I think this is like a, this is like a select society. That was a mistake. Don't ever do that because it basically tells everybody else they're not selected. Um, but, so, but what we did that was, that, was, that was right, I think, was we met one time a month and the purpose was for nothing except accountability. So in Wesley's model, the select society is a group of people where he would develop his leadership team from. So that's what I was doing. I found leaders in the church and said, we're going to meet one time a month and we're going to work through scripture and we're going to hold each other accountable for the disciplines in our spiritual life. We were trying to do the same thing. So in the inaugural meeting, I think I listed like 20 different spiritual disciplines. Some I just got from books, others I made up and I just put them on a list. And I said, what I'd like us to do is each one of us commit to doing two of these things over the next year. And it has to be two things that you don't already do. So if you already get up at six in the morning and have an hour with God, you can't circle that one because you do that. Add another one, right? So some of them would like circle one that says, I'm going to read through two spiritual classics, Thomas de Kempis and Brother Lawrence, stuff like that, in the next year in a meditative uh, state of mind. Uh, someone else would say, I'm going to go off to work and share my faith proactively one time a week for the next year. It was those kinds of things. So when we gathered uh, at the end of each month, we'd go through the scripture. And then the second half of that meeting was basically uh, going around the room and saying, Don, uh, I've got you down for these two spiritual disciplines. Uh, how have you done this last month in carrying out those, those disciplines? What has happened and what has God shown you in that, in that time? Uh, so I, it seems like it, it went very parallel to Wesley's um, uh, society group. I might have hijacked it a little bit in order to make it contextual, but it it seemed like it like it like it worked for us. Okay. Now I know that's specific to like what you were doing there, but if we're looking at a general concept in the church, we were talking about um, these benchmarks almost that you would have for newer Christians as they move along. Could yeah. we take those benchmarks and then place them into Wesley's model of society class and um, band meetings and have it be a move along as people meet these different benchmarks. Interesting. I hadn't thought about it. Maybe you can. He did have a, he, he had a, yeah, he, are you thinking kind of the signs of life um, could be uh, put into the, like the, um, the, I'm trying to think of the name of the one um, uh, for like penitent. Um, is that what you're thinking? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, where he, I can't remember the name of his group, but he had a group where people had actually fallen away and they were trying to create a pipeline back into the church. You're thinking we might be able to um, interface some of these signs of life with that. Mm -hmm. That's a great, I had not thought of that. That's a great idea. One of the things uh, kind of, kind of related to that is, we're intentionally beginning in our, one of the things we have to realize is that what, what Steve is talking about here uh, requires the, the willingness to start small. Um, this isn't something you can just roll out among a massive group of people and then say it's fixed and everything moves forward, right? It's got to start small and it has to multiply. Um, so we have to go in with the willingness of saying, we're going to start in some smaller groups and, and pray as we do discipleship together, pray for those people that we're going to go out and then disciple as well. Right. And, and, and one of the things I'm starting to develop here is taking um, that soulship language that we use and in our, and in our material that helps those smaller discipleship groups, uh, it helps us to focus on those spiritual outcomes of discipleship. Does that make sense? So when we start talking about moving from sheep to shepherd or from me to we, 
our questions that we interact with on in our discipleship groups are based on that language. So we're all while we're all meeting in separate small discipleship groups, we're all speaking the same language and we're all pointed in the same direction. Um, and and that kind of comes from building on Wesley's Wesley's questions that they used every week, right? Mm-hmm. Um, it's kind of that 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 it's it's structured, but it has freedom as well um, within the smaller group. Um, I think I. Yeah, I just want to stress, Eric, what you're what you're saying. I want to reiterate that. I I think um, if I were to go back into the church I started in, I wouldn't tell anybody I was doing this. I wouldn't necessarily preach on it. I wouldn't try to make a big splash. I wouldn't design a fancy program. I would find two or three guys that I met with every month, and I would pour into those two or three guys. And then at the end of a year or two, when I felt they were developed closer to the target that I had designed, then I would start to release them, each one of them, to find a couple more, not more than, than that, on their own. So it would be a slow uh, and mostly invisible um, process for the first uh, few years. But then I think, there's a, I think there's a tipping point in the life of any organization where the little pocket of life that we've started starts to gain critical mass. And as that critical mass then gets moved into key positions within that church, the climate of the church begins to change. That can't happen, though, first. And a program can't do that. It, it, it has to be transmitted one-on-one, and it has to be life that we're transmitting, not inf- information. Steve, can I ask a, a question? Why You keep going back to this idea of meeting um, once a month. Is there a specific reason for once a month and not yeah. more often? Yeah, well, no. Just in, in my case, it was schedule. When I met with guys one-on-one, I met once a week. I met every Tuesday uh, for like Bible study time. Uh, And again, all we did on that was just this week, we're going to read through this chapter or two of the Bible slowly every morning and let those words wash over us. And as anything comes to mind, why did Jesus say that? Why didn't he answer the question? Things like that. We jotted those questions down. me and them. And then when we got together, we would air those questions and talk through them. Uh, The formative component in that is that it trained us to, to, to think about the mind of Christ. The question really wasn't, what did Jesus do? The question was, why did he do that? Why on earth did he act like that and not some other way? Why did he say that and not something that I would say? So it, you know, it starts to point out the differences between his mind and mine. That was hugely formative. That was every Tuesday morning. Then on Thursday night, I would meet with a couple of guys and we would go make calls. And that was more practical ministry. Like we always had a list of three or four places that we had to, had to go. And then, um, uh, going in and out of those homes uh, provided almost rich, uh, fresh material for, for us to get back in the car and dialogue on what just happened back there while we were on our way to see the next person. So you're talking about a almost, um, I'm going to use mental, but like a, a thinking process in going through the scripture and then an applicable process in going to go visit and do things so that you were teaching uh, both aspects. Yep. 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 Dave, did, did this, did this discussion kind of answer the question you had posted a minute ago? Yes. I've, he just answered the question. Okay. That's, I kind of thought so. Um, one of the things uh, Brian answered online, I'm not sure he has a microphone. Uh, how, and Steve, we've talked about this some, I don't know if you have an answer for this one or not. How are we going to assess the character uh, and skills that are being targeted in the, in the process or in this relationship? How do we measure? Wow. Um, yeah, I don't think we do this well enough here, um, you guys, but what we, um, 
uh, just uh, maybe a preface comment is ultimately what gets measured gets done. So um, it's essential that we find the right measurements. And, and, and so what, what we're trying to establish now in our church, and we're not there yet, we're still in process, is using the seven soul shifts. What should the measurements be that we're looking for? Right now, at least for the last maybe eight to 10 years, the three numbers that everyone is asking for in local churches is one, the number of people attending, two, the number of people baptized, and three, the number of people saved. You and I both know that those three numbers do not measure a transformed life, not even close. So what then are the numbers that measure a transformed life? Go back to your target. So for us, it's the seven shifts. So as we look at consumer to steward, we might say, have the number of giving units or tithers, has that number increased in our church or not? Are we seeing a number of people starting to give in some systematic way in the last year uh, consistently more than they did before? So we start counting those. And I think since January, uh, the number I heard, we be between 25 and 30 new tithers or givers uh, just in the last about five or six months in our church. So that's an uptick. Now, again, you can fake that. You can tithe and still not be growing spiritually, but it still gets us closer to measuring the target of, of what we're trying. One of the things we look for here is the number of first-time volunteers. I never volunteered to do anything before, and I'm going to step in and be a greeter or in a classroom or of some kind of servant in the church. We're trying to measure that with sheep to shepherd. Instead of just attending like a sheep, I'm going to lead like a shepherd. Um, such. So uh, about a year ago, maybe a year and a half ago, we commissioned 388 lay people from our church, got them all onto the platform. The platform was packed uh, and basically commissioned them with vows and prayed over them to release them as shepherds in their community. Each one was then responsible to go out to the place where they worked, and they each had to identify anywhere between three and 12 people in their workplace that they were going to assume responsibility for. They were going to shepherd them. Uh, and then we taught them and trained them on what shepherding means and how you shepherd people and uh, and such. But then they, they vowed to do that. We bring them on the platform, commission them, release them. That's an important number for us now because it helps us measure one of, the, one of the shifts. But we have a long way to go. Steve, um, I'd like you to talk just a little bit about, we've had a little bit of conversation. We have the soul shifts um, that are available. And like I said, I'll, I'll post those on the Facebook group. Um, when we're done, or you can email me. I'll post my email in the chat. Uh, but one of the things I, I want to emphasize is that you and I have kind of talked about the soul shifts are good, but it's good to go through this defining the target process in your own context. Yeah. Talk a little bit about the importance of that. Yeah. I, the first thing I would do, again, if I could go back uh, to my first church, uh, knowing what I know now, that's the first thing I would do. I would, I would find three or four people in the church, uh, at least that I would sit down in a room and I would say, our job is not to just win people to Jesus. We have to do that. But understand, it doesn't matter how many people we win to Christ if they don't act like Christ in important places in their lives. So we have to disciple what we win. And then with that kind of passion, uh, I would say our job is to define the um, target. Then I would simply put the scriptures before them. I would say, let's read the scriptures. What does the Bible say uh, a fully formed life is? I would say, 
try to identify three or four people in your life personally that you know is just growing leaps and bounds and what characteristics do you find in them? And then I would start putting those lists together and define my own target. Then after I had the target in mind, then I would say, let's back up and talk about the launch. And after we were able to identify what we thought the signs of life were, then I would say, now let's talk about the process. What can we do as a church to become a culture of discipleship? How do we become a church where it is hard not to grow? You just step into the place and the environment and the people and the spirit of life that is in this church grows you. <laughs> it holds you accountable. You feel responsible. Uh, one of the things I'll make available, I think I'll be able to post this in the Facebook group. And again, you can always email me if you don't have Facebook or you can't get in the group or don't want to be in the group. Um, is I've, we've developed like a, just kind of a, some PowerPoint slides uh, that have some of those things um, that will build the conversation with that group that you put together. Um, those common characteristics of people who are, who are living as devout disciples. Um, those prayers of Paul, uh, the signs of life. Um, so I'll make those available to everybody and you can use those uh, in those groups that you want to put together uh, as needed. Um, we only have a few minutes left. Um, if anybody else has a question or if Steve, if you wanted to wrap us up uh, with anything specific, uh, we just got to have a few minutes left. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, in our church, we have two values that are very important. One is self -feed, people self-feeding themselves the Bible. Yep. And the other one is really following the Holy Spirit and letting the Holy Spirit guide. Uh, could you tell us how those fit into your, uh, what you're, you're doing and such? Yeah, yeah. First of all, those are really, really great core values. I want to affirm both of those. I think you can build strong disciples on those. Um, to the first one, uh, what, we, what we've done here in the last few years is we create a little booklet that, um, that we distribute alongside sermon series that I preach. And that booklet uh, is frequently uh, nothing in that except scripture. So what we found is when we turn people back and say, we need to become self-feeders, read the Bible for ourselves, they frequently don't know where to go. Do I go back to Genesis and just start at the beginning? Do I go, uh, you know, and there was like, whatever you do, don't go to Lamentations, man. Don't start there. That's going to be heavy. Um, so they don't know. Um, and sometimes we just give them a gospel, do the gospel of John, but they don't know really how to read it. So, um, so what we do is if I'm going to do a sermon series on, say, the identity of Christ, then what we'll do is we'll go through the Bible and, and rake out passages of scripture that speak to the identity of Christ. You are seated with Christ in the heavenlies, right? Set your mind on things above, not on things below. Um, and, and we paste those inside this booklet. And we say, for the next six weeks, every day, we want you to open that booklet and read just the scripture that, that, that we've pasted there. Because it parallels the themes that I'm preaching on. Then on the other page, so you open your book up like that, and on this page is all scripture. The other page just has three questions. That's it. And we design those questions each time we do the book. As you read this passage, what is the one thing that you learned about God that you didn't know before? That may be one of the questions. And we just leave space for notes. So what that what that does for the people then is, is they feel like they're following the series, they're reading in the scripture, they're getting their own insights, and it starts to train them to believe, you know what, I can hear from God. God can say things to me when I read the scripture, and it ties his voice to the scripture, which I think is essential, because I think God may use different mediums to speak to us, 
but there is no portal more direct than the Holy Scriptures. So as they read the Scripture and they have these thoughts and they pray with God at that time, they start taking copious notes. Uh, uh, and then it, we start to get both of those things that you're talking about. I have the Scripture and I'm listening for God's voice and I'm taking notes while I'm doing that. And then what happens is when they get together in their small groups, they have their notebooks. So like I'm in a group of about 12, 15 people, they bring their little notebooks and they open them up and they're reading to each other the notes that they took while they were in private time with God. Does that make sense? I think you're on mute, brother. Uh, yeah, yeah, that makes, uh, that makes sense. Uh, you know, we, uh, we do a lot of different things like that. Uh, we're, we're, we're kind of a uh, both and sort of church for everything, <laughs> you know, every way possible. You know. God bless you, man. Yeah. Those are fun churches. <laughs> We're going to um, start wrapping up here. Um, I think our next meeting uh, is going to be August the 22nd. Um, we would love it if you'd join us again then. Um, this looks like a pretty manageable group, Steve. This is a little more ruly than we thought it might be yeah. with 85 people involved. Um, so we'll be able to keep continue to interact. One of the things we would encourage you to do uh, is to try to get some people together uh, and start defining um, the target of what discipleship looks like in your church. And we'd love for that to be some of the feedback in our next meeting as you get great. kind of interacted with those groups. We'd love to hear how that went, um, what came of it. Uh, we'd love to hear some of your targets. It might be different than ours. Um, yeah. Maybe we'll steal them. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, is it, Steve, do you have any last uh, things you want to send them out with? Yeah. yeah I, you know, I just want to thank you guys for um, spending the hour like this. I want to thank you for the work that you're doing in your local churches. Um, I know that you're just embedded with the people there. And I know that your heart beats for making more and better disciples of Christ. And, and I want, I just want you to know that my heart is beating at exactly the same speed. So uh, thank you for the time that you've, given us. I'm just humbled to get to spend the last hour with you. Well, um, go with God, uh, seeking the Holy Spirit, uh, and living as disciples in the world. Um, God bless. Thanks, Eric. Thanks. Steve. Great job. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>